Good morning, superhumans. And I hope you're all having a fantastic weekend. I'm having a pretty good one. <laughs> it's um, my, just been my son's 16th birthday this weekend, so that's been really cool. He's got uh, a couple of cool presents. So we've had a couple of my birthday weekend a couple of weekends ago, and here's this weekend. Uh, I can see that we've got a whole bunch of my usual friends here today. Before I get into it, I just wanted to do a quick shout out to the Victorian Aboriginal Health Service. Um, they're based in Fitzroy, actually not far from my dad's place, and uh, they do really good work providing um, assistance to the local Aboriginal community, and they've set up specific COVID testing. They've got a respiratory clinic there. So my uh, weekly um, Aboriginal awareness uh, message today is thank you to the Victorian Aboriginal Health Service for the work that they do. Now, um, <laughs> happy birthday to Superhouse TV Junior. <laughs> Thanks, Leon. Uh, so, I came into this today with almost no idea of what I was going to talk about, uh, <laughs> which is pretty normal, but usually I have at least some idea, and I was sitting here 20 minutes ago thinking, I don't know what I'm going to talk about. So today, we're going to be chasing squirrels. Many, many squirrels. We may even chat, uh, we may even catch some. I've got a couple of questions from the, um, the sponsor section in Discord. And there are a couple of things that came up in the help uh, channel as well that I'll look at. And we can t um, go through questions and things. So, um, all right. So looking at the questions in the sponsor section, <laughs> Well, the question from James was, how hard is it to keep your desk clean? Um, the preview that comes up when I do these live streams is the channel preview image, which is a photo that I took a couple of years ago, looking, basically standing over there somewhere, looking at my desk. And my desk is not that clean. Peter, what are you doing sending me money? You don't need to do that. I mean, I appreciate it, but thank you. There are no poppers set up. Um... In fact, the, um, the popper board is right here. Nothing left on it. I used it on the MakerCast last week. Uh, so my desk looks a little bit different to what's in that preview picture now. That was actually before I had the anti-static surface across the whole desk. I just had one of those green cutting mats sitting here somewhere. And um, there is a little bit of stuff on the desk now. It's not as neat as it used to look in that photo. And also there is more test equipment. There is more stuff up on the shelves along here. I've got little hutches to put things in. So you know, easy access to stuff when I need it. And uh, I got a video, which is an updated uh, lab tour, which is partly filmed. And uh, that's gonna show some of the, the way I've got my desk set up as well. And some tips. There are a series of principles that I've used to try to optimize my workspace. Um, I think there are seven. It's not like they're, you know, the seven commandments and I have them all memorized, but it's um, principles like uh, local resource caching. So, uh, just as, okay, headers. Some, something like pin headers are things that you use all the time and you want to be able to reach for them and use them when you need them, but you might need to store larger quantities of them. So I've got essentially a, a three layer system. When I'm sitting here at my workbench, I can reach up and I've got like the headers box and pull it open and it's got uh, pin headers and sockets, some uh, heat shrink that you use when making up things. It's got different colors, they're uh, right angle, they're straight. Uh, so it's just like random bits of all the different things that you might need. So a lot of the time if I'm working on a project and I want a header, I just reach up, grab it and it's there. But that's only odds and ends of different things. On, you can see the there's a wall of drawers there and there are drawers here for 
um, larger quantities of headers, like there's a draw for pin headers, there's a draw for uh, sockets, and there are different draws for um, 0.1 inch, 0 uh, 2 millimeter pitch, etc. Mm -hmm. And so I've got local caching at my desk. I've got slightly larger quantities there. And for real bulk quantities, then I have larger containers like this one. And that's when you need to reach for you know, hundreds and hundreds of yellow pin headers or hundreds and hundreds of red pin headers. You know, there are basically bulk quantities of everything in there. And, and so in setting up my lab, I've followed um, as I said before, I think it's currently seven basic principles like that. And those principles are things that, um, well, another one, this is a classic one, and this actually ties into the, uh, the local caching principle. And the, so this other principle is um, frequency equals proximity. And that is, if there is something that I reach for multiple times a day, I shouldn't have to move my chair. I should be able to just reach it and grab it. If there is something that I use once a year, it's okay for it to be on a shelf out in the garage or up inside the ceiling. If it's something that I use maybe every week or two, then it can be on a shelf that's further away from me and I, I have to stand up and go and get it. But the, um, so the basic principle is frequency equals proximity. The, the closer things get to you, the more valuable that space is, and therefore you have to be more selective about what's there. So, uh, Frank said, I think you need more storage. I do, <laughs> yes. Um, so, oh, David White asked, I need those plastic storage boxes. Where do you get those, Bunnings? The <laughs> this is kind of starting to preempt the um, the video that I'm filming about my office organization. The uh, the larger one that I showed you with the bulk storage of pin headers, they come from Officeworks. And the little ones, like these ones, these ones actually came with Spark Core kits. In fact, if you look on the front of it, you'll see it says Spark Core. And that is, uh, that's because many years ago, there was a project for doing the electric blind controllers that I've talked about a number of times. And we're using um, particle photons and spark cores as the controllers inside those electric blinds, which meant that I was ordering bulk quantities of spark cores. And um, there was, at some point, there was a problem with a lack of availability. And the only way to get them was to buy complete kits, like um, internet starter kits. And the way those kits came was in these plastic containers. So I ended up with like a hundred or something of these kits. And it had, so what I would do is open the kit up, take out the spark core and we'd use it in an electric blind. And then the rest of the kit, I would just pull out and it would get filed away. So I ended up with lots and lots of plastic boxes and all of the other parts that come with those, um, those internet starter kits just because I wanted the spark cores out of them. Uh, yeah, and there are other storage containers as well. I've got like 50 litre, 80 litre uh, plastic tubs that are out in the garage. So, yeah, as I said, because of this proximity, uh, frequency equals proximity thing, I tend to have very small storage close to me because I've got small quantities of many things. And then the larger containers up on the shelves and then the really big containers out in the garage. That's where I've got things like, I have two 80 litre plastic tubs just full of IEC leads, like power leads. You know, just big bulk quantities of things. Uh, which I should probably throw away many of, but <laughs> I can't bring myself to because that's when you need it. Alrighty. Um, so this all came about because of the question of how do I keep my desk clean? And um, part of that is there are some of those other principles. One is 
the way I do storage of projects as well. And the idea is, oh, one, one of the other principles is um, single task context or um, you know, one task focus. There are different ways I say it. So the idea is that if I'm working on something on my workbench, there should not be things from other projects also on the bench. It's like in a, uh, a CPU where you switch context and you switch totally into that context and um, everything else is shoved off into longest, longer term storage. It's, uh, I think it's just the way my brain works. I don't like, I really don't like having a workbench that's totally cluttered with things. And um, so if I'm sitting here working on one thing and I've got, I've got to keep like pushing things out of the way to make space on my bench, that just drives me nuts. I hate it. So what I've become very efficient at is task switching or context switching and that's one of the reasons that I do have all these tubs, like um, that's an example. This is one that I pulled out many times. So the open adaptive controller, or the mini open adaptive controller that you've seen a few times. Inside this box, it's got prototypes and piece. There are PCBs that could be assembled, and cables, and 3D printed enclosures, all the stuff related to it. And if I'm working on this project, I can bring down this tub and I've got everything I need. And when I'm finished with it, I just grab everything, put it in here, put it back on the shelf and it's out of the way. And then I'm not losing things related to that project. It means that my desk is then totally clear and then whatever else I'm working on, I can bring it down and start to work on it. So my desk does not look as clean as that screenshot but it is not far off it actually it's I and mean, right now I've got this sitting on my desk because I was working on that I've got an idea for something else I want to do with it but it's uh, it's relatively clean uh, okay uh, alrighty so there was a question from Daryl uh, about who said that I mentioned on a few live streams there were projects that inspired or helped me learn or interested me. Were there any that stand out for any <clears throat> stand out to you for any of the previously mentioned reasons? Yeah, last week I started talking about the Leo stick, and um, I there were a couple of others. So. The Leo stick, I won't go back into that in detail because I talked about it last week. It, Arduino Leonardo compatible in the form of a USB memory stick. And this is the one that I was waving around last week with its little OLED shield on it. So that's the Leo stick. Plug it into your computer and you've got an Arduino Leonardo with all of the I.O. right in your USB port. And that's the little OLED shield that I had on it. So... Uh, that was a significant one because I was working, partly because I was working with very little information. And as I explained last week, I was trying to replicate the exact pinout of the Arduino Leonardo, which hadn't even been released at the time, but also because I had this picture in my mind of the physical constraints that I was working to. And I wanted to make everything fit into that memory stick size. And I'd never done anything this tight before in terms of trying to make everything fit so I uh, pretty well um, it, it was a challenge that I didn't I actually didn't know if I could do it I wasn't sure if everything would physically fit into that space and so at the time um, my friend Mark was still actively involved in Freetronics and he basically just said, yeah, you can do it. Come on, just, just sit down and puzzle over it and you'll get there eventually. <laughs> he gave me some encouragement. Uh, otherwise, I probably would have given up. And so I just sat there feeling like my eyes were bleeding as I was adjusting things and trying to make it all fit. And I got it all to fit eventually and it all worked really well. So many, many thousands of these have been made. 
but it was a challenge that um, I suppose it's a little bit like a a video game. If you can beat the if you beat the game easily, you don't get that big buzz. This was a real challenge, and I I put a lot of time into figuring out how to do it and really pushing the limits in terms of how close I could put the vias and oh do people pronounce it vias or vias? I know people that pronounce it vias, I know people that pronounce it vias. I've always said vias, but I don't know if that's just because I read about it in a magazine and never heard anybody pronounce it, or if that is really how it's pronounced. So and I can't even remember what VIA stands for. Something like vertical interconnect something, whatever it is. So that as a challenge was something that gave me a real kick. And um, succeeding at that really gave me confidence to go on and keep doing more PCBs and building more things. And one of the other projects, so there are a couple of projects like this that have been uh, a really big challenge and that have made me, uh, it, it's like you develop a little bit over time and then some big challenge arises and you figure out how to do it and it takes your ability to a, another little step, it increments it and then you sort of go, I'll go along for a little while longer meet another challenge and uh, then you get another big increment in your ability. So another one that w that really did that for me was the Argusat project. Once again it's one that I've talked about a fair bit in the past and I'm gonna pull up the board here. Do I want to load it? Yeah, so this is not the most recent design what I've got here, and I'll stick it on the camera, is the version, this is the actual version that went into space. So there were some slight improvements to the design after this, but this is a snapshot exactly as it was, the version that went up in RGSAT X and RGSAT 1. And as you can see, there are a whole lot of tracks there, so it's a four layer PCB and 17 CPUs, or 17 processors on a single PCB and a very big schematic, so it's a very repetitious schematic but there's a lot going on and uh, so it's the main, the ATmega 2561 which is the management processor that dishes out the jobs to all the different experimental nodes in the satellite and then the nodes have their own uh, yeah, so payload processor node 1, node 2, <laughs> node 3, the only thing you'll see change is the number and the part designators, so each of the nodes looks exactly the same but then when you look at it on the PCB it can be kind of overwhelming particularly with the layers all overlapping and uh, I put many many hours into routing this PCB as you could tell and it was at the time that I did this, it was the biggest and well, it was the most complex PCB that I'd routed. So, um, and it had some physical constraints as well. One of the reasons that I couldn't just lay these processor nodes out in a nice grid, which would have made it super easy and I could have done the job in a third the time, is that there are connections to the, uh, the instruments that are part of the satellite payload. So you can see there are these holes here, um, these, these four are in a rectangle and then you can see there are more holes down here which are for mounting other parts of the payload. Uh, there was a, um, an optical instrument which was used for spectral analysis and um, a Geiger counter and a few other things. There were actually a bunch of sensors on this satellite, I think there were 20 something sensors, 22 sensors and so they had to be connected on the bottom uh, this PCB sat on the bottom of the stack of uh, this basically like a, a layer cake of PCBs all stuck together this one sat on as the bottom layer and then directly below this were the optical instruments and the Geiger counter 
and uh, let's see if we go to let's flip to um, bottom view oh, just processing this board on my computer takes a while you can see the little cursor there waiting let's go to bottom view and single layer mode oh, you can't really see all that much from there but there are some connectors on there and where, where, where? Yeah, I can't even find them. Probably easier if I rip that up. Yes, that is easier. Okay, so you can see there's a connector here. There's another one over here. There's a connector down here. One down here. And these all link through to the, um, the different instruments in the bottom of the satellite. So the idea with this particular satellite was that it would be oriented with the base of the satellite facing towards Earth, and that would be used, or, or it could be rotated. So the um, it's basically like aiming the instrument set in whatever direction you want, uh, which was pretty cool. So doing that was a real challenge. That uh, it really opened the way to me for doing uh, more than two layer PCBs. So I'd done, up until that point, I think I'd done two four PCBs that were four layer. And this was the first really complex four layer PCB that I did. Uh, but then having got over that hurdle, it then opens up the possibility to be able to work on other sorts of projects, which is cool. So, um, there are, uh, let's see, hunting squirrels, what are we doing today? Yes, Triple H asked, I'm like, what are we doing today? Hunting squirrels. Yes, so, um, let's flip that board back over, and look at the top of it again. I just like this one, and I keep bringing this one up because I'm so proud of it. It's one of those things that, uh, mm, how do I put it? Uh, if I say life-changing, that's not really, uh, it's not really overstating it because it kind of was. It's one of those things where probably 10 or 20 years from now, I'll look back on this project and think, yeah, that was quite an achievement and, uh, and be really happy with how that turned out. And just after being interested in space and space technology for most of my life, like so many nerds, the that moment of watching the live feed um, from the Tanagashima uh, Space Center as the HDV4 launch was taking place, that was one of those moments in my life that I will never forget. It, just watching that rocket launch and knowing that there were two satellites on board that I had helped design, that was a bit of an epic moment. Um, not very home automation related though, so let's get off that and have a look at some more questions. All right, so something that came up in the help channel. This is not really specifically a question, but I think, but it's a recurring topic and it's something that I would really like to hear. Um, uh, I really like to hear other people's opinions on, which is power over Ethernet and DIY power over Ethernet, like 12 volts or whatever you want to put down it, versus 802.3 AF, you know, like slash AT slash AX or whatever the most recent standard is. What you use, what you would like to use, and if there are things that are missing that would make that easier for you. When I was working on the the Freetronics Ethernet Shield design way back in 2010 or whenever it was, 2009, there, doing power over Ethernet for microcontroller projects was really unusual and um, it's still not particularly common. But I, I think it's a really useful thing. And so one thing that I that I personally would like to have, but I haven't, and there probably is this, but I haven't seen it, um, is 
an Ethernet switch with built-in DIY power over Ethernet. And actually, yeah, there are some switches like this. I think maybe even Unify used to make them. And um, uh, well, someone did. I can't remember who. I know it's not a standard and people should be using 802.3 AF putting 48 volts down the wire, but then that has attendant problems as well. For hobbyist projects, it's just a pain when you've got to put a DC-DC converter on the other end that can handle 48 volts and that can do the correct signaling. So for that sort of thing, I typically use Silvertel modules because they incorporate the signaling and when it, when it powers up connected to the Ethernet switch, it can communicate with the switch and say what class of device it is and how much power it needs and negotiate that power delivery connection. But sometimes you just want 12 volts on the end of a wire and that could be really useful. So, um, ah, so Thromboy just said, some low end ethernet switches with PoE don't seem to provide galvanic isolation for the PoE supply. Yeah, that's true. Uh, so that, can become an issue once you're once you're dealing with PoE sort of stuff. So um, you can end up with ground loop problems, and uh, yeah, I've been bitten by that in the past as well. So just the very brief explanation for that is when you get started in electronics. Well, certainly for me, I always thought of um, of grounds as being the same but they're not. Like a ground on one thing and a ground on something else can be at a completely different potential difference. Although when I say ground, the thing is that there's some terminology that's often used in a very fuzzy way. Ground <clears throat> and zero volts are not necessarily the same thing. So if you have, for example, a laptop which is running from um, so you've got it plugged into a charger, you're powering the laptop, the laptop has a USB port, and you've got 5 volts out on that USB port. Now that 5 volts is between the 0 volt and 5 volt terminals on the USB port, but then you have some other device which is running off a plug pack, and it might be something like a microcontroller with, um, you know, you've got a board and you've got a plug pack and you've plugged in a DC power supply, and then you want to plug into the, um, the USB to link it to your computer. So the zero volts from the plug pack that's going into here may be at a different voltage to the zero volts that's coming out of the USB port on the laptop. Now I'm giving you a bit of a contrived example here, I know that, I'm just making it up on the fly. But the thing is that there might be a five volt potential across the power rails here and a 5 volt potential across the power rails at the other device but that doesn't mean that they are the same they could be thousands of volts apart like the actual difference between them could be very significant and when you connect them together you can have big bang magic smoke comes out and all sorts of bad things happen so most of the time when we're dealing with hobby sort of projects we can ignore those sorts of issues and um, we can just join the grounds together and if they have a common ground reference then voltages are relative to that point So we've got the zero volts on the board Zero volts on the other device if you have five volts on this board. It'll be five volts on the other device as well so they are They're kind of they're locked together because they've got that common ground reference but that's not always the case and it's the situations where it's not always the case are often the situations where you're using something like power over ethernet because um oh yeah johnny said tell me about ground loops i designed an audio mixer and when i connected my tv the speakers went crazy turned out the antenna ground to the tv created a very large ground loop antenna yeah that's the sort of thing um so the situation where you're using power over Ethernet, you've got some kind of a device in your house that you are powering over a long network cable, that is probably the situation where you are most likely to need that isolation. 
because if you've got um, some other device okay <laughs> I'm gonna be trying to make things up here and say things that I'm not an expert at but the other device is more likely to be at a different potential or to have something else connected to it that is on a totally different um, power circuit or whatever and have some voltage differential that is going to cause a problem. So, um, I hear Thromboid said, so true about ground does not equal ground. I've seen sparks coming off shield ground scraping against a laptop or Mac Pro aluminium chassis. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, a, um, uh, a little while ago, I did some work fixing a problem on a power over ethernet on the design for a power over ethernet uh, ethernet switch and um, that was done for it was a, a contracting job <clears throat> I'm not going to go in I'm thinking about how much to say about this I'm not going to say very much at all it was done for a contracting job for a client that was working on a project that needed to have sensors that were uh, mounted remotely, connected by Ethernet, and they wanted power over Ethernet, but they wanted low voltage power over Ethernet, like just send 12 volts down it, and then have the device at the other end, the sensor at the other end, powered up. And uh, they were having some problems with the circuit for the Ethernet switch. So what they'd done was designed a custom Ethernet switch to go inside their equipment and it would inject the power and then power the devices at the other end. Um, I didn't do the original design on the Ethernet switch. I came in to uh, do a bit of a quick debugging session and figure out what was going on. There were some problems with the um, with what was happening, you know, with that design. It was kind of working, but not quite. And so they sent me a prototype and some information about what they'd done. I figured out the problem, fixed it, and provided the um, the resolution, and they, they then implemented it. So I didn't actually design it, but it gave me some insight into how Ethernet switches work and how to integrate power over Ethernet power delivery into the switch. So since then, I've one thing I've had in the back of my mind is it would be interesting to design my own Ethernet switch and build... Um, passive injection into it so I don't know if that would be um, uh, yeah I don't know if that would be useful or safe or economically viable but I think it would be interesting <laughs> it's one of those projects where you know a lot of equipment that we use even if we do engineering we still think of a lot of things as black boxes. Any type of device that you haven't worked on, you think of as a black box and inscrutable and that you can't possibly understand how it works. Like just some examples. Uh, your mobile phone. So even if you work in electronics and you do circuit design, you maybe you do home automation stuff, if someone asked you to draw a block diagram of what is inside this little black box, how the different parts of it work together. If you haven't worked with mobile phone design, you probably can't do it. And it probably seems, or it certainly feels like it's beyond your ability to understand. And things like a USB hub or an ethernet switch, or you know, all of these sorts of classes of devices that we use every day, many times a day. And we still, even as technologists, treat them as a black box. And, uh, yeah, I find that really interesting because <clears throat> you can't know everything about everything. You have to work within the areas that you have experience with and that you're exposed to. But sometimes things happen that take the curtain away and you get to see how things work and all of a sudden you realise that's not as mysterious as I thought. And that was really the experience that I had working on that Ethernet switch project. So when I was contacted asking if I would help with um, you know, fixing this Ethernet switch design, I said, sure, I'll take a look at it. 
and um, I think it I think I had it all figured out and fixed within like two hours it was a very short space of time and when I saw the schematic and I had the prototype in my hand and um, you know powered it up and measured a few things and I thought Ethernet switches aren't as complicated as I thought they are they're they're actually relatively simple and repetitive designs. So there are certain things that you have to take into consideration, of course, in terms of things like um, trace lengths. And, you know, there are, there are certain specific considerations to designing an Ethernet switch. But it's not, a <clears throat> it's not a whole new branch of science. If you have done work with, um, with electronics, and someone opened a, a schematic for an Ethernet switch and sat with you for five minutes, in fact, probably wouldn't even take five minutes, you would understand the basic building blocks of what goes into it and how the thing connects together. Same with a mobile phone. There was that project that, um, that a few of us did for the Open Hardware Minicon for quite some years ago, where, in fact, I'm gonna pull that up. This is an interesting project. This is another one of those projects that was like a, um, a step for me. Uh, where are we? I've got to find this. So, Arduino phone. I'm not sure if it's under P for phone or under A for Arduino. But I've got to um, dig through. Okay, phone and phone too. Because I designed a, um, an updated version. All right, this is the original. Or is it? No, I've got another copy of a project here. Okay, this one. This one should be the one that we want to look at. Now the... Oh, come on, open. Thank you, computer. Uh, desktop. Alright, so this is actually an updated version of Arduino Phone. So Arduino Phone, the original version, was designed for the Open Hardware Miniconf. And uh, what we did was get everybody who participated in the workshop to build their own mobile phone and then they could write their own firmware to run on it and everything else. So what, <laughs> this is going to be a bit scary looking at this schematic because it's a few years old now. When was this version done? So 2013. Uh, oh come on. The zoom in Eagle is a bit weird. So the different parts of a mobile phone, when you look at it, it's not really that complicated. Now there is, of course, there are levels of black boxes. If you look at the design for a piece of electronics, there are going to be many black boxes within that, like integrated circuits, and you don't necessarily understand how the integrated circuit works. Um, at an intermediate level, there are modules. So a module could consist of multiple integrated circuits, and it has some magic. So you could say it's turtles all the way down. But if you look at the, the project itself, like the RG phone, I'm going to get it because this is a cool one. And since we're chasing squirrels today, um, where is phone? I need to find, I haven't pulled this project out for so long. Somewhere around, it might even be out in the garage. There is a, um, I've got all the prototypes and things for, I, oh, there it is. So, oh, there's one right on the top. I'll switch back to main camera view. Where is my cursor? There. Okay, so that is an actual RG phone. So you can see it says. RG phone, it's not RG phone 2. So this is the version that we built at the Open Hardware Miniconf. And I wonder if it even powers up. So the main parts, it's got the keyboard down there. So it's got numeric keypad. There is the little navigation keypad here. The whole thing is designed to work like a an early Nokia mobile phone. So, you know, menu on there, uh, keypad on there. Do T9 for text input for sending messages and it's got the antenna at the top. On the back there is the module, which I'll talk about in a second. There's a LiPo there, and this has been sitting in the box for years, so I've got no idea if there's even any charge on this. 
And you can see there's a place to put a SIM card and there's the display on the front. In fact, that display is a module. So if I wiggle that and take it off, that's the it's a 128 by 128 color OLED. And you can see that, whoops, if I turn it that way, this part of it looks just like an Arduino Uno. And that's almost what it is. So, hopefully there is some voltage in this. Let's see what happens. Oh, we've got some power. Is anything going to come up on the display? I don't know if there's any firmware loaded on this at the moment. I don't see anything on the OLED. Maybe it's not booting properly. Maybe it just doesn't have any firmware. Um, that's right, I think there's a charger circuit built into this. So if I plug this into a USB cable, we might do something. Maybe, not that USB cable. Um, maybe this USB cable. So there's it, little USB socket. Oh yeah, there it goes. LEDs are flashing and it's powering up or charging or something. Is there a power switch on this? I can't even remember what the deal is with this. No, I don't think there's a power switch. I think it is just, uh, yeah. All right, I'm really chasing squirrels now. The point is, this is a fully functional mobile phone Although this one wouldn't work because it's 2G and it would need to be updated. But this is a fully functional mobile phone that you can use to make phone calls. There's a microphone there. There's a spot up there. That little socket is for a headphone jack. You can plug in a headphone. There's a, um, a piezo connection there so that it can ring. And yeah, a whole lot of options. So you could attach a little speaker up here as well. So what you could do is you could 3D print a case for this and you could use this to make phone calls and, you know, hello, and it would work. It's a phone that you can build yourself. But um, the main point of that is not to have a phone to use necessarily. It's to be able to understand how phones work and to break open that black box. So in the schematic, we can see, yeah, you know, there's the LiPo charger. So we can see the major parts of it. There's the power supply, the LiPo charger, keypad matrix down here. This is the GSM module, which has got the baseband processor in it and um, does a whole bunch of other stuff. So that is a little bit of a black box, but as I said, it's layers of black boxes. And by peeling open the project, you can see how those black boxes interconnect and then you can keep delving into them. You can then learn more about how each of those black boxes works. And uh, coming down here, we can see the, 12, the 18 mega 1284p processor, um, USB to serial. It's got an FTDI FT230X uh, converter on it, Arduino headers, LCD module. So the LCD is being driven off the main processor. And this schematic here. So what I'm showing you here, if you except this little black box, this high rose ADH 8066 module, which does, which has got the, um, the GSM transmitter and receiver. That's where, and it's got the SIM card mount on it. If you accept that black box, then this is all you need, that whole thing, to build your own cell phone. And when you see that, it makes you realize that this mysterious thing is not really so impenetrable after all. Obviously, this is dramatically more sophisticated than what I'm showing you here with RG Phone, but the principle still holds. The, uh, the basic principle that if you, if you look at the things around you, you can leave them as a black box, like a USB hub or an Ethernet switch or a cell phone, or if you want to, you can dig into it and you can under, you can start to see how the parts within it work and have that curtain pulled back. So that was the experience that I had. Um, I'll make it, I thought 2G phones still work. Um, only in very backward countries. <laughs>
Um, 2G was turned off years and years ago here in Australia. And then there was 2.5G and 3G. Um, 3G is going away, I think, in some places. There are many places that don't have 3G service anymore. And um, pretty much all functional phones now are on 4G. And the newer ones coming out of 5G, of course. So, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there are devices on 2G, but, yeah, I don't know. They stopped. Here in Australia, they turned that network off a long time ago. Um, so... Uh, what was that? Someone said, can it make, um, uh, can it make phone calls? Um, oh yeah, Carl Mead said, well, it can make phone calls. Yes. So with this, it even had a snake game. <laughs> so if we get enough charge into this eventually, I don't know if it's going to, it would be really cool to power this up. Um, where is, if I hit reset, what happens? Nothing. Uh, so what happened was that the hardware for this was created for the Open Hardware MiniConf, but there was very little software support. And uh, so what happened was we turned up at the MiniConf with these kits and with some really basic software that just allowed you to um, initiate phone calls, I think like voice calls, and not very much else. And because LinuxConf is an event that's full of uh, super smart software hackers, what happened was that by <laughs> within a few days, participants at the MiniConf, I think largely led by my friend um, Mark, who um, comes along to the Open Hardware MiniConf every year, Mark Merlin, uh, got really jumped on this project and hacked around on the firmware. And by the end of the event, they, there was firmware on this that made it work almost like a Nokia. There was... Uh, like T9 protect, predictive text, so uh, so you could send text messages using the numeric keypad. There was a snake game. You could you know send and receive SMSs. It was it was actually a useful, fully functional phone. Uh, yeah. No, Mike just said yeah. It was Mark. Yeah, Mark Merlin who did a lot of that work. All right. Um, Uh, yeah, so, uh, uh -huh, okay, <laughs> Roman just made a, a point that I was really wanting to get to, so I'm just going to stop this um, scrolling back. All right, this brings back to my original point of however long it was ago before I started chasing this squirrel about um, understanding devices, which is, I've been thinking for a while about designing an Ethernet switch with built-in power over Ethernet, and I've also been thinking about designing my own USB hub because there was another project that I did for a robotics company a couple of years ago uh, where I had to design a USB hub that fitted into a very unusual shape um, inside a robot, and it, um, uh, yeah, I'm wondering how much I can say about that one as well. I don't think it really matters. That company is no longer making robots, so I don't think it matters. But anyway, what I did was um, designed a USB hub that was a disk. And um, so this was working with a mechanical engineer at this robotics company. And uh, so the mechanical engineer figured out how it all had to fit. This was within the neck of a robot. It was for a telepresence robot. And the shape of the PCB was very strange. In fact, I have it just over here somewhere, I think. Yes. Yeah, this one's fine. I can talk about this one. I've always got to think about it because some projects that I work on are for commercial clients and they, um, I often can't even mention that I'm working for them. Like it's just a subject that can't even be touched. And some projects are totally open source and I can show you the designs and it's all good. And some are... Uh, of commercial projects where 
the um, the company or the person I'm I'm working for is okay with certain things being shown, but it's still proprietary, and I I really want to respect their business and their um, their input and what they do. So I don't want to do anything that could possibly jeopardize their business. So um, a good example of that is the water cannon project that is right there. So Simon, who um, who owns that company that I'm doing that work for, he's he's got a really cool business, a really cool project, and I love working on it. And there is no way I want to do anything to jeopardize his business. I want I absolutely want his business to be as successful as possible, and I always want to do the right thing by him. So um, he he's really good about allowing me to like have that in the field of view of the camera like right now on the live stream the fact that you can see that is because he says it's okay for it to be there and be visible uh, but otherwise it would be out of sight and you would never see it you'd never even know I was working on it but of course I won't go as far as showing you the designs for it because that would be jeopardizing his business so um, when I'm doing these live streams I always have to be careful about what I'm talking about and um, and how much I'm revealing so for this particular thing I will, um, yeah, this company is no longer even building robots. And um, the person that uh, that I did this work for, I'm sure would be fine with me showing this. So um, this is, a, see this little strange shape? That's actually a USB hub. And this goes inside a tube and it interlocks with some other parts of the mechanism. And that's why it's that really strange shape. It's actually a USB hub integrated with a detachment mechanism and on the back it's got these big copper pads that intersect with pogo pins. So they're pogo pins with a rounded end and the idea is that if you think about a vacuum cleaner, now if you've got two parts of a vacuum cleaner tube, you can push them together and twist them and they click, like depending on the design of the vacuum cleaner of course. Now imagine instead of a vacuum cleaner, what you're trying to do is pass electrical connections through you want to have two tubes that have a mating connector on them and when you plug them together and twist them they click into place and they make an electrical connection that passes through. That's what this is for. And these little contacts um, were for pogo pins that connected from the other half of the mechanism that plugged into this, it rotated into position and it made connection. And you can see that one of the contacts is a bit longer than the others it's backwards. That one there is longer, and that's so that's because that's the ground connection. So when the two parts mate together and then rotate, it makes contact on ground first. Well, actually, it's which one is it? No, I think the center one is ground. I can't remember. But anyway, it makes contact on the center first, and then it rotates, and then this one makes contact, and then the other two make contact. So I think it might be ground, and then power, and then the data pins, and so working on this project, this was another one of those things where until I had worked on that, USB hubs seemed like a mysterious black box. And I thought, I could never understand what's inside a USB hub until I worked on this. And I realized inside a USB hub, there's a chip, a couple of supporting parts and some connectors. I mean, how hard can it be? There really isn't very much in them. And so... A project that I've had in mind for a little while is a hacker USB hub and I've, I've actually got so far as doing some very rough uh, work in Eagle uh, trying to lay it out not really anything serious just like concepts like throwing down some ideas and my idea was to make a USB hub that would be um, slimline so I could mount it on my like under a shelf just above my workbench so I've got a row of USB sockets, make it all USB-C, uh, provide power on all of them because I want to be able to just plug things in and power it from there, put in power monitoring. So what I could do is put a current sensor onto each of the USB ports and ideally have an integrated OLED, like one of those little 128 by 32 OLEDs, the long skinny ones, have one of those integrated into it so that it could show the... Um, the voltage and the current on each of the USB ports and I was also thinking of integrating a processor into it so that I would have the USB hub 
chip that uh, provides the upstream connection and then the ports that are on the front that you can plug into, but then use one of its downstream connections and connect it to a CPU or like a microcontroller, could be like an ESP8266 or something, and put it inside the hub. And that is what would talk to the OLED and it would talk to the current sensors, but it could also appear to the host computer. <coughs> so the USB hub itself would be a device that you could um, communicate with. So what you could do is data logging on the USB ports. So if you plug a device into one of these ports on this hacker hub, you could do things like chart the power consumption of a specific USB port because the processor inside the hub would be able to report that back to a computer. So anyway, those are the sorts of things that were going through my head. And um, so that's what, uh, yeah, so Roman's comment about that. Uh, sorry, I, I didn't actually read Roman's comment. It was a type of switch that I cannot find on the market yet. 10 times USB-C only hub, all input, and outputs being USB-C, feasible or nightmare to build because of PD Thunderbolt compatibility, etc. Um, yeah, so it would be um, that partly comes down to what you want to support on each of those USB ports. Um, and James said, "All control with MQTT, of course. <laughs> you could you could run your own firmware on the Hacker Hub, so you could." be whatever you like. Um, and so this all comes down to power and the way the USB-C spec works with power delivery and negotiation and it could be really really complicated. Um, they're <laughs> trying to make USB-C devices that deal nicely from a power management point of view is really hard and you see really silly situations happen because um, because USB-C is designed to be bi-directional it loses it loses the original concept of I've got a USB um, now the whole difference between on a USB cable having say micro USB on one end and USB A on the other end or USB B the uh, you don't see cables that are micro USB to micro USB it makes no sense whatsoever because in the USB 2 world there is only ever one device that is going to be supplying power to the other and you don't have power going back in different directions. USB-C um, is totally different. It opens up all sorts of different things like being able to uh, plug a laptop charger into your laptop and charge your laptop. And then you unplug that and you plug your phone into the laptop and the laptop charges the phone. Like that sort of use case sounds really obvious and you think, yeah, that sounds fine. That's very similar to what we already have without USB-C but the difference is that because the charging of the laptop is happening through the USB-C connector it means the laptop has to be able to both accept power on USB-C and provide power on USB-C and that negotiation has to happen between the two devices. Now here's another one that it really starts to illustrate where things get weird. Okay imagine you have a USB uh, C battery pack. So you've got a little power bank that you can use for recharging your phone. Now when you plug your um, power bank into a wall charger which is USB-C it charges up and then you plug it into your phone and the, you would expect that it would charge your phone. But the thing is the negotiation between those two devices as to which one is the one that provides power happens between them at a software level and you can end up with a situation where you plug a phone into a power bank and the phone starts charging the power bank and you're actually draining your phone. That sounds ridiculous, but it happens all the time. It's one of those situations where you have a certain combination of devices and they interact in ways that you didn't predict. I mean, I saw something, I can't remember who it was, it might have been Brian Locke 
someone on Twitter, like just this week, uh, posted something saying uh, that they had plugged, I, I think it was that situation, like they'd plugged their phone into a power bank and it started draining the phone to charge up the power bank. So these are not theoretical problems, they're real problems. And when you come to designing something like a USB hub, that is something that would have to be taken into consideration. So it would need to be set up in such a way that the USB hub can only ever provide power, not drain it. Now, of course, there are situations where you might want to use a hub to drain power. Maybe you want to build a test system where you want to be able to discharge a power bank into the hub and have it as like a dummy load. But of course, that's a totally different use case. <clears throat> so what I... Um, as I've been thinking through this and the idea of building my own little hacker hub, uh, and another aspect to it is I want to be able to control power programmatically from the hub. So if I've got a hub, say I've got a, a hub sitting here attached to my bench and I've got microcontrollers plugged into it, I want to be able to reflash those microcontrollers through the USB connection um, using my computer. But I, from the computer, I also want to be able to turn power to individual ports on and off. I just kill a port and then bring it back again. So that could be because something is misbehaving. It might be because I've got a test system. I've got a development system sitting here on my bench. And I just want to be able to turn it off you know, without unplugging it. And so from my software environment here where I'm managing things like looking at the, uh, updating the source code that is on that target device. Uh, I might be uh, looking at the power consumption. So I'll be seeing, for example, uh, I've got an ESP32 attached to it. And when I get it to initiate Wi-Fi, then I can see a current spike because I'm recording it off the hub that's providing power to the device. And then I want to be able to power cycle it. So click a button in like my control software, have it turn off the power to that particular outlet on the hacker hub, power down the device, power it back up again, you know, all sorts of things. And uh, so this whole idea of making my own USB hub that does exactly what I want kind of intrigues me. I don't know if other people would care. <laughs> oh, yeah, so Jacob Johnson just said HDMI over USB-C is a thing too. Yes. All right. So this is getting to the crux of the matter. And that is expectations and constraints. So as I've said before, um, engineering is all about constraints and trade-offs. It's about looking at what your objectives are and then what are the things that shape or guide your design to make it work in a certain way. If I, this is one of those projects that nobody's ever asked me for it. It was just something that I've been thinking, I would really like to have a USB hub, USB-C with power monitoring and power control and some kind of smarts built into it, like stuck on my bench. It's something that I personally wanted. So it's been like a, a third tier project that has been sitting way down my list I've given it some idle thought and um, not a whole lot more than that. But it comes down to the this whole thing of constraints. If, I'm, if I do end up moving ahead with this and end up designing my own USB hub, I would need to make some design decisions about what limitations am I going to impose. For example, uh, so this comment earlier about um, <clears throat> about HDMI over USB. So my use case would be on my workbench with a microcontroller dev board plugged in. I want to update it and I want to power it and I want to monitor the, its power consumption. I think that summarizes my use case. I don't want to pass through HDMI. I don't want to do... Um, I don't want to accept power from a device that is plugged in on the bench. Uh, and so that, that narrows the scope. And then the next narrowing beyond that 
is do you really care about USB 3.1 um, like supporting everything or do you just want a hub where you can plug in a dev board now for me personally I would not see this as being a hub that I would use to replace a proper high-speed USB-C hub to plug in like external hard disks that's just not the use case it would be plugging in dev boards because 99% of what I want to do is USB to serial at the other end there's just going to it, it's really just like a backwards compatibility mode where I would have a dev board plugged in and it would have like an FTDI chip on it or a Scilabs, like a CP2102N or something on it. Essentially an Arduino. So all it's going to be doing is operating in backward compatibility mode in um, like the most, would I can't remember the particular names of the standard. It's like you are high speed USB, like 480 megabits a second. But even that is way more. Than you ever actually use for a microcontroller project. <coughs> uh, yeah, so uh, oh, Austin's Creations just said it's kind of funny that something on your idea and possible build list is I'm designing a custom battery management system with similar aspects of monitoring and controlling everything. Yeah. Uh, Oh, and Mako said, most laptops use 19 volts, right? Yeah, so 19 volts is pretty much the standard for external laptop chargers. If you just go and buy, like if you get a, an HP laptop or a Dell or whatever, pretty much universally they use 19 volts. And that's just because of it's a convention around the way the cells in the laptop are set up, like the particular combination of cells uh, by standardizing on that it means that laptops with the same cell arrangement or a similar cell arrangement can use similar um, battery management system it's really common so in the USB-C spec it allows for negotiation of different voltages with previous versions of USB it was 5 volts or nothing that's what you get and this is also one of the complications is that when you make a device that plugs into USB-C the simplest possible thing you can do is take the two um, status, like the current negotiation pins, and tie them to ground through 5.1K resistors. And what that signifies to the device on the other end, which might be some kind of an intelligent USB-C power delivery device, if it sees that those two status pins are pulled to ground through 5.1K resistors, it knows uh, this particular device can't accept anything but 5 volts and go into backward compatibility mode and just give it 5 volts down the line and that's it. That's the simplest possible case. Now for me, I think that was that is all I would need. So narrowing these specs down further in terms of this whole concept of what a hacker hub could be, I would probably only provide 5 volts out of it. Now this is a situation where I'm not necessarily going to be taking a, a laptop with USB-C, sitting it on my bench, plugging it into my hub and then trying to charge it. I don't necessarily need to get 19 volts or whatever it is out of it. I don't want to be pulling 60 plus watts out of this little hub. The purpose of the hub is to give me a convenient way to plug in microcontroller boards and work with them on the bench. So... Um, that is okay so let me have a quick look at some comments um yeah trady trev says from a distribution perspective uh perspective 48 volts is enough i'd let the general public play with yeah 48 volts you can do a bit of damage with yes yeah oh and jacob said you can skip the hdmi alternative mode i was just throwing the info out there yes that's right and the the USB C spec is ridiculous. It's like a phone directory. Um, <laughs> good luck reading it and understanding it. It's it's the classic design by committee solution where 
all of the vested interests get together in a room and say, I want this and I want this and I want this. And then they say, why not have it all? So they shove it all onto one connector. And it just, the whole idea of one connector to rule them all is good in theory, but it's led to so many complications for engineers trying to work on devices with USB-C interfaces and confusion for consumers who might have two identical looking USB-C cables and one of them works for some things and the other one works for others because the internal connections are different. So yeah, USB-C is one of those things where there are elements of it that I absolutely love. It's, it is really, really nice in some ways and painful and frustrating in other ways. For me personally, I am moving to USB-C for everything that I possibly can, but in backward compatibility mode. That is my compromise, as it were. It's the way that I get the advantages that I care about for USB-C, but I don't overcomplicate things for myself. You know, the classic example is the Ether Uno design, which um, I've shown a bit over the last couple of weeks. This is the prototype, and you can see it's got USB-C on it. And I've got USB-C on the mini open adaptive controller and on basically anything I've designed with USB-C within the last year or so, it's got USB-C on it. And uh, But what I do is use those two sense resistors to ground and um, run it in backward compatibility mode. And I basically just treat it as a nicer connector for USB 2.0. <laughs> and maybe that's lazy, but that's just what I do. Oh, and Sion, Unexpected Maker, just said, same with me, USB-C, but in USB 2.0 mode. Yeah. All right. Uh, yes, <laughs> Mako said, USB-C is a jungle. And it is not a very friendly jungle. Uh, yeah. Oh, and Johnny said, sounds like my 10 USB port power distribution boards just 5 volt out on A connectors. <laughs> Let me show you something. <laughs> um, somewhere over here, maybe if I can find it, uh, I have a project. Where are we? Power board. Um, oh no, there's this one. Somewhere around. Yeah, it's not quite the same thing, but. This is a project that I did for wheelchair power and <laughs> very similar thing. It's like an octopus lead. So you've got power, it, all it does is a bunch of 2.1 millimeter sockets all wired together with a power status display on here and power in can come from screw terminals or it can come from a 2.1 millimeter jack. And yes, I know there are octopus leads that already do that but the um, the idea with this one is that this is mounted inside an enclosure and that's attached to a wheelchair. Oh, Andy Mouse, thanks for hanging around. I know this is a horrible time for anyone in Europe. <laughs> um, so you're pretty much offset from me as far as you can be. And uh, thanks for hanging around. Um, so this goes into an enclosure and it's designed to go into a commercial injection molded enclosure and it's got all the, the screw hole mounts and everything. So what we do is cut the slots in the enclosure, mount this inside it, and then the whole enclosure gets mounted on the wheelchair. And um, oh, Johnny says use a similar board for 12 volt power distribution, 2.5 millimeter jacks. Yeah. So this is used on wheelchairs for 24 volt power distribution because that's the standard voltage on uh, on wheelchairs. And so it's like a, it's basically just a row of power sockets that you can plug different things into um, on the wheelchair to give them power. Very similar concept to what you're talking about with a row of USB jacks. And in fact, that idea, um, Johnny, of what you're talking about of a row of USB sockets that just provide nothing but power that is exactly where this idea started. Um, so I did this and as a little power distribution board for wheelchairs. And then after I did that, I thought I should just do a version of this with USB sockets on it. 
because I just want to be able to plug stuff in and power it. <laughs> James just donated new shirt fund for Superhouse TV and we should get some in the store. Well, yeah, this is my original very old one. It's a couple of years old now and it's coming apart. Um, so, um, <laughs> thanks James. So, yeah, I done this power distribution board. Then I wanted to do a power distribution board for USB. And because I had done this USB hub project a few years ago, I just started thinking, how about I just take these two and mash them together? USB power distribution board, but also make it a hub. And then we can add some more smarts to it, put some power monitoring in it, and make a USB hub that does what we want. <clears throat> that is, um, that's really where that whole <laughs> train of thought came from. And part of that, in terms of power distribution, is that it is so common for me to have something like an ESP32 project. Where's an example? I've probably got one nearby. It's really common for me to have an ESP32 based project that I just want to put power onto it because I can do um, over-the-air software updates and I just, I just want to plug it in and make it run. So the standard thing for that is you plug it into a mobile phone charger, but on a workbench it's annoying. It'd be better just to have a row of powered sockets and you have your project, you plug it in, it gets power, connects to Wi-Fi and away you go. Anyway, I have, uh, my list of projects is way too long already, but if this does sound like it's something that's interesting for people, it has been on my wish list for a while to have a USB hub with USB-C and power, mon power monitoring and some smarts built into it. All right, so, uh, uh, okay, <laughs> actually, I've got something funny to show you. <clears throat> um, all right, I'm gonna have to go into the back room to get it because it's not something that I use very often. It's one of those things that when you need it, it's really useful. So, does anybody want to do bulk USB charging? <laughs> this is a device that I got in, yeah, back room equals bathroom, that's correct. Uh, this is a device I got at a market in China, and it's, um, it's one of the devices that is used at the, at the cell phone repair and, um, you know, places where they sell phones, sell cell phones. Uh, it's pretty normal for them to be trying to charge dozens and dozens of phones all at the same time. So inside this, like I won't bother taking this cover off now, but you can actually see through it. See the silver in there? This is basically just a massive 5 volt switch mode power supply in a box wired to a bunch of USB sockets. So I actually had this on my um, up on my bench for a while. It was on the shelf uh, fairly close. And in fact, this was really useful when uh, in the early days when I was working on the, um, the remote control blind controller project, because what happened was that when we were commissioning the, um, the blind controllers, each one of them had a spark core in them and then a particle photon. And when you are commissioning them, what you need to do is power them up and leave them on for a little while, and then you can um, <clears throat> you can set them up onto the correct network, and then they join your Wi-Fi, and then you can push firmware to them, etc. But when we were doing things like firmware updates, we might be wanting to do updates to you know 10 or 20 or 30 devices at the same time. So what I would do is have is I had this sitting up on the shelf and it was just like a massive USB cables coming out of it. 
and there were dozens of um, spark cores plugged into it, all powered up, all connected to the Wi-Fi, all doing their firmware updates. And then when they'd finished with their update cycle, we'd pull them all off and then grab another batch and plug them all in. So, uh, but then it ended up, when I wasn't working on that project, this ended up sitting on the shelf. And that amount of space on my shelf immediately near me is premium. Uh, so, oh yeah, what's the supply rating? 40 to 50 amps, I assume. Yeah, something like that. I don't know. It's enough to deliver... Uh, yeah, I'd have to open it up. I can't remember. But uh, it's a lot. <laughs> um, and the other thing is that it's got a fan in it. So it's a little bit noisy when it's running, which is kind of annoying. So it's not the sort of thing, if this was silent and you weren't so concerned about power usage, it's the sort of thing that would be quite useful to have sitting above your workbench and just turned on all the time or whenever you needed it. And you can just plug devices in to charge them. Um, and yeah, it looks like a Meanwell PSU in the metal box. Station 240, I think that's exactly what it is. And James says, well, they even fused it and added a switch. They did. Uh, so the thing is that they're, it's really interesting hanging out in, um, in China at, around the markets and around the the places that do phone repairs because what happens is there's this whole ecosystem there of tool suppliers and parts suppliers and jig suppliers that you just don't even know exists outside of that context and um, so things like this are an everyday item in the mobile phone markets in China like everybody's got them but if you haven't been there and you haven't seen how they do it, you wouldn't even know that something like this exists. So, um, yeah, and yeah, that's just one example. There are many tools and you know labour-saving devices and convenience things that they have that yeah, uh, yeah, the rest of us just aren't even aware of. Now, what I'm hoping. I've been hoping that this phone would come to life so I can show you. I wonder if I've got another prototype somewhere because it could well be that that particular one just doesn't have the firmware on it. I wonder what the deal is with that phone, that phone. I've got a few phones here because I would really like you to see this thing powered up and running its, uh, its snaky firmware. Now, I'm going to unplug that one. Oh, it's still turned on. All right, I'm going to turn it off. Maybe that's the trick. I just need to turn the whole thing off and power up the thing again. No, nope. doesn't look like it. <clears throat> Get that off. I'm going to steal that OLED, put it onto a different phone. This one doesn't have a battery, and I don't know if it's going to do anything useful, but we'll see. Oh wow, it does. Um, awesome, so this one seems to have um, some firmware on it. Oops. All right, being able to see this is not that easy. So what you can see here is, if I press the reset button, it comes up with a startup screen. It says Freetronics RG phone. And then it comes up with the, um, the menu, which looks like a Nokia menu. And on this live stream, you're not gonna be able to see this. I'm not gonna be able to get focus on it. But basically it looks, it works in the same way as a Nokia menu. So I can use the down, like I can use up and down keys to navigate. So it's got call, SMS, lock keys, and then it's just got other menu items. And if I go up to SMS and press the right button, it goes into it, enter number, so I can type the number that I want to send the message to, click next, enter your message, and then it uses you know, multi-click input to, um, to put the text in for the message, and then you can hit send or cancel or delete. So I'm just going to cancel that and go back to the main menu. Now one thing you won't be able to see is up in the top right corner of the screen, there is a little um, animation 
some little boxes that are spinning in a little, funny little pattern, which shows that it is, oh, it's blanked out the screen, um, which shows that it is trying to connect to a mobile phone network. And right now there is no SIM card in this and 2G doesn't work anymore anyway. But as you can see, that's um, if this was actually connected to 2G network, that's a functional phone. Oh, this one doesn't have a microphone on it or a, uh, a socket for a headphone or a speaker. So this is a partially complete one, but at least it's got the running firmware, which this other first one didn't seem to have. <laughs> Pretty cool. That was such a fun project. I'd like to make my own cell phone again. Uh, I could do it with an updated GSM module, something that was like a 4G module. But it's one of those things that, uh, yeah, I'd do it basically because I I want to. Oh, this one's awake now. Okay, so this is the one that had the battery on it. It must have just been that it didn't have enough, like the battery was flat enough that it was pulling the, um, the power rail down and being a problem. So this one, uh, it looks like it's got the same version of the firmware. It doesn't have the snake game on it. But that, let's see if I unplug USB. Yeah, so it's now running fully on battery power. And uh, of course, you'd have no problem getting through airport security with this. You know, no problem at all. You could just walk through and they wouldn't even question the fact that you've got a little improvised electronic device with a display on it and a numeric keypad on the front. And cell phone connected. <laughs> um, <clears throat> yeah. I have actually traveled through... I've shipped these, like when traveling to the... Um, the mini conf, we had to travel with a bunch of these. Uh, Aaron, <laughs> Aaron's joining the t-shirt fund. Thank you, that is extremely generous. Now, Aaron has contributed a lot of funds over the last couple of months. Yeah, IED, improvised electronic device. Um, so, uh, thanks Aaron, you're, you're very generous. And um, I've got to admit that I still need to send you the Sonoff uh, programming, uh, you know, the ESP flasher, the little Sonoff, not just Sonoff, but the um, the ESP32, ESP8266 programmer. Uh, I promised that I would get a package in the mail to you, and I've got, I need to finish off a couple of the boards that I want to put in the package. So um, hopefully I will get that to you in the next couple of days. Get it shipped at least. It's got to go all the way to the UK. So transit time might be a while. But yeah, I definitely owe you those. Thanks, buddy. Um, cool. It's all good, no rush. <laughs> yeah, but I still want to get it done. This is the problem is that I keep chasing these other projects and then I don't get back to one the um, the ones that I want to do. And the... Um, the ESP Flasher project is one that uh, it's right there. Like I've got the PCBs, I've got all of the parts. I need to populate some boards. In fact, I've already populated some boards. I need to add headers to them, and um, uh, then I, I need to do a video about it. But in terms of being functional, it's right, and I use it myself. The board is ready. It's done. I could be releasing it. I could do a video about it, but. Uh, I just never seem to get these sort of things finished. And as Mako says, I see loads of squirrels behind you. Yes, lots of squirrels back there. I keep chasing squirrels. Um, so many fun things to work on. All right. Now, <laughs> this whole episode has been chasing squirrels. And the thromboid has just asked... A home, an actual home automation question. Like, who'd have thunk it? Um, so, Thromboid says, home automation question. I have some dehumidifiers I want to control remotely. User manual says not to switch them on off using the mains. Could a Sonoff four channel pro dry contact relays work? Now, uh, the answer is probably yes. But oh, and Trady Trev says contactors work like a charm. But there might be a complication here, and it depends on the um, the way the controls work for the uh, the dehumidifiers. 
it's possible that the reason they say that is they don't want you to just cut the power unexpectedly because there might be other things going on within it and it might need to shut down in a clean way. Now, I'm not quite sure. <laughs> oh, Frank just, just uh, donated some funds. Forget the ESP flasher done. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that one is so close. It's so close. Um, depending on how the dehumidifier works, it may want to do, I mean, I don't know anything about this particular dehumidifier. You haven't given a lot of information, but it may be that it needs to go through a shutdown state where it has a pump that needs to run for some reason. Uh, it, there could be lots of reasons that they don't want you to just turn off the power. Now, as, um, as Trady Trev said, contactors work like a charm. If you're controlling a high power load, and you want to just turn power on and off to it but you do need to be careful of what you're controlling and whether it is expecting power to just go away unexpectedly and so um, yeah so you have to be careful about that um, and for those who are wondering what a contactor is you can think of it as being kind of like a superpower relay. Uh, so a relay is an electromechanical device where you can use a small signal to control something else. Uh, you, the relay contacts move and it makes and breaks connections so you can turn power on and off. A contactor is a different mechanical arrangement for achieving a similar thing and they're used in higher power situations or situations where you have problems with arcing um, like if you're powering 240 volts or if you're powering higher voltages and at high power and you don't want the little zap zap arcs that are going to eat away the contacts on the relay so contactors are, are used in that sort of situation um, yeah oh, Adam P said compressor stall can be a problem if you cycle them too fast yeah so for a dehumidifier it may well have a um, uh, some a compressor in it uh, basically working like a fridge in some ways uh, kind of similar concept from a um, from a mechanical point of view so and thromboid says yes it does run for a few minutes after turning off using the control panel so to get back to the original question you probably can use something like a Sonoff SV which just provides a switched relay output and connect that relay output across the power controls on the dehumidifier. So whatever button you press to turn it off, if you uh, work across the, if you put your relay across that and you run Tasmoda firmware on it and then you put the, um, you use the pulse time option, I believe it's pulse time, <laughs> my memory isn't that good, but I think there is, an, yeah, there is an option in Tasmoda where you can tell it to activate its output for a predetermined period of time and then turn back off again. And pulse time operates, if I remember correctly, in tenth of a second increments. So if you set pulse time 5 as the option in Tasmoda, it means that it will pulse the output for 0.5 of a second. And uh, that sort of thing is a good sort of uh, guideline to use if you're uh, if you're taking a remote control or a device and you want to be able to control it using the Sonoff SV, then set like pulse time 5 or you know some period that you think is sensible. And then when you tell the Sonoff to turn on using Tasmoda, it will turn on for 0.5 of a second and then turn back off again. And that's just like you've walked up, pressed the button and then let go of it. So it's the same thing as if you have manually controlled the dehumidifier. All right. Um, yeah. So that's a um, this sort of situation is actually exactly why I designed the ESP relays and ESP remote board. Uh, another one of those things that I haven't released, but I've shown a few times. And let me find this one. So this is the um, Uh, this is an ESP8266 with some switched, some low side switched outputs. So this one has four FETs on it. 
and then what you can do is take a remote control and attach it here but effectively this is doing the same thing conceptually it's the same as if you've got something like a Sonoff SV and wired it across your um, your buttons in your control panel just that this one's got four outputs instead of one and it's using low side switched FETs instead of relays and then there is also the ESP relays board that um, I've done which has six read relays on it and this is like having uh, six Sonoff SVs with um, in a little box uh, let's see switch back to that view um, <laughs> when is this from it'll be years and years old this project and I still haven't released it but this is uh, yeah this is conceptually similar to the Sonoff SV um, yeah so Johnny summarized it well uh, so in short AC no parallel to the switch yes yeah that's cool uh, alrighty um, oh station 240 has provided a, an explanation of the difference between a relay and a contactor so uh, a relay has one moving contact on a swing arm a contactor has two moving contacts on a piston or a solenoid so yep cool so similar end result in terms of what they're trying to do but mechanically different they achieve a similar end result in a mechanically different way so that it minimizes arcing and all of the other problems that are associated with relays uh, and they tend to work with much higher uh, power yeah oh, James said read relays in my experience weld themselves easily yeah so with read relays you they are very delicate devices and uh, I'm actually amazed at how little power it takes to trigger a read relay but the um, the outputs on a read relay tend to be extremely low power you certainly you can really only use them for switching signal uh, signaling sort of circuits like in place of a button on a control panel you can't really use them for switching power to something like turning something on and off directly running the power through the read relay and uh, yeah that's that's exactly why I did this ESP relays board oh, you can't see it now taking it away from the screen it's not intended for switching power it's intended for switching logic level signals like um, linking a 5 volt uh, 5 volt potential on one side of a button to 0 volts and you're going to have a few milliamps running through it uh, typically what will happen is that the buttons on a control panel will have a resistor that pulls them high and then the button will link it to ground so it pulls it low and then the microcontroller can detect it but the input impedance of a digital pin on a microcontroller is usually fairly high it's like a hundred kilo ohms or something like actually probably higher than that I think it might be significantly higher so the amount of current that flows through a read relay when it is switching a digital input going into a microcontroller is very very small um, oh but then you've got to account for the current through the pull-up resistor as well I forgot about that so but even so if you use like a 10k pull-up resistor you're still talking about like down in the milliamp region um, depending on the voltage of course so you're switching milliamps it's not going to be anything that is going to cause problems for the read relay just by having that across it uh, so um, a couple of questions in relation to that David Flynn asked is there anything that works like a p-channel MOSFET as a switch I don't really understand that question so maybe you can explain a little bit more about what you mean David and in the meantime Scorch Stuff said relay board has isolated grounds the relay board so that one that I just showed is totally isolated and that was actually why I did it now I'm going to switch back to so this one which is the ESP8266 relays board the outputs from these are entirely isolated from the control side so if I switch back to the schematic what you'll see down here like channel 1 for example there is a MOSFET which is switching the read relay 
and then the output terminal of the relay has no connection to anything else on the um, on this board and I did that specifically so that you could connect this to a target board and know that you are isolated from it electrically not necessarily from a safety point of view in terms of you know achieving a thousand volts of isolation or anything like that but from the point of view of you don't need to understand the connections within your target device and the way the switches work so you might have um, you might have a target device that has a keypad matrix and you want to be able to wire across multiple keys in that matrix so the way that matrix works is that there are going to be rows and columns that are scanned by the microcontroller that is attached to it and so it might be switching uh, switching a row or a column from being an input or an output at different times so you might even have things like the polarity rev um, being inverted on those switches in the matrix there are multiple ways it can work depending on whether you've got things like um, diodes to prevent um, ghosting and all sorts of things I won't get into right now because it's beside the point the point is that it is just providing contacts and you can put those contacts across something and you don't have to care about how it interacts with anything of the rest of the circuit and as Frank McCallenden just said that's a dry contact interface exactly yes so this is this particular board is simply dry contact outputs that you can connect to whatever you like uh, so there's no common ground issue there um, and that was actually the reason I did that. This was the second board I did after doing this one, which is similar in concept. And if I go to the schematic for this one, you'll see the outputs here. But it's using the FETs to directly uh, control the outputs. So the TX button, what you could do is wire the high side of a TX button onto here, but you need a common ground for this to work. So what you do is you link ground from this receiver to ground on your target device, like on your transmitter or control panel, and then you wire one of the connections from the connection from the high side of one of the buttons on your target device to say pin one, which comes through to here, and there is a um, uh, there is a FET here and when you turn the FET on it pulls it low so it effectively grounds the whatever you've got this connection to on your target device now this works really well particularly if you like it works well if you have a transmitter that expects to be running at about 3 volts because the really nice thing is that you can just connect 3.3 volts from this board to the power rail on the transmitter and you don't need a battery in it anymore because you can power your target transmitter off this little interface board and you've got a common ground, you've got common power rail and all we're doing is using transistors to switch the lines that are using the buttons. So if you've got something like a garage door remote control this works very well because the inputs on a garage door remote control generally are not a matrix, it's just like the, the little rolling code um, encryption authentication thing driver chips that are used in those transmitters are very simple they just have a number of inputs they might have like four or six inputs and they are normally pulled high and you pull them to ground and it activates transmitting that particular event so if you are wanting to take something like a garage door remote control and add Wi-Fi to it this scheme works perfectly because you've got common power and all you have to do is pull those buttons low. It's just pulling digital inputs onto in the transmitter low. Uh, so that's why I did this one first. But then I had problems with, there was a particular thing that I wanted to control and I had to keep it isolated, which is why I did this other version, which has got the dry contact outputs. <clears throat> all right. Okay, so um, is it common with um, thromboid said? Is it common for appliances to have logic voltage floating with the mains AC? Um, there are a couple of different schemes for that. 
And this is where you can really get yourself into danger. Um, I don't know enough about it to be able to give advice that is not going to get people in trouble if they follow my dodgy advice. So I'm going to, at this point, I'm not going to say very much more about it other than it's potentially extremely dangerous. And I've, um, I've had a couple of situations where I have screwed up badly and thought that I understood what was going on within a, uh, within a target system that I was working on and I didn't understand and then I ended up with a potential difference between two things that I thought were the same voltage and they weren't and bad things happen. Big bangs, smoke comes out, tracks get burned off PCBs, uh, wires melt, all sorts of things happen. Uh, <clears throat> so, yeah, um, okay. Now this is getting into an interesting question that I don't really know how to answer. Uh, Aaron Knox said, Lots, loads of these random designs you show uh, seem like great products. I'm assuming a lot of the community would buy. What would you say is the biggest reason why so many stay designs only? Um, so, <laughs> I have wondered that and I would like some way of fixing it, of fixing that problem. Uh, yeah, oh, and then Aaron goes on to say, time, money, doubt, all, thought it would be good to get insight as you're not the only maker that seems to be in this position. Yeah, I think it's, um, I think this is a kind of common issue and I really wish I could resolve it. Now, I could give the, the flippant answer of, um, when you do, you do 80% of the fun bit of the project and then you realize that the remaining 20% takes the other 80% of the time. <laughs> it's kind of like that and as Cable Ties, uh, Cable Tie and James said squirrels are real. Yeah and Mako says selling and reproduction is not the nicest design is. All right so <clears throat> this is something that I think would be a really good topic of discussion in particular with Sion, because I think he would have good insight into this as well. And it ties into something that Sion and I have talked about um, a little in the past, which is the unseen cost of doing things. And also, last week I talked about Brian Locke's blog post uh, of all of the unseen labor and the sacrifices that he makes to create his products and take them to market. So on the MakerCast last week, I mentioned <clears throat> I mentioned the issue. I, uh, one little illustration. I normally do shipping of products six days a week, or I, I did before COVID. So six days per week, I go and stand at the workbench out in the garage that way, where I've got shelves and shelves full of products and I've got a label printer here and the laser printer so I print out the labels I print out the orders I go and stand there and I pull all the things off the shelf and I pack them put them in boxes tape them up and then after I've done all of that I go down to the post office and stand there at the counter and go through all of the things and um, <laughs> yeah uh, Frank said in electrical, it take, we say it takes 10% of the time to do the 90% and 90% of the time to do the last 10%. Yeah. Um, so, uh, it is a, just doing that every day is a burden. And the thing is that every day I get up in the morning and I think this morning I'm going to get straight into working on a video like from the start so that I can make progress on it. And what happens is I come out here and I see a list of orders and I print them and I go out the back and I start packing them and before I know it, it's like late morning, time has gone by, <clears throat> it's just, it's a burden. And then um, I'm being my own fulfillment service, which I really shouldn't be. Um, and then, so what I, the thing I, the 
point I made on the MakerCast is when I, the first round of isolation started here in Melbourne, my local post office closed on Saturdays. And so what happened was that I was no longer taking orders down on the Saturday morning. Now, the thing is that the boxes and things aren't even cleared on Saturday. So there is no collection from the post office on a Saturday to take the packages to a distribution center. The first pickup that happens on, is on the Monday. And in my head, I had sort of built this thing up where I, when an order comes in, I need to pack it and get it marked as shipped and notify the customer that it's shipped as quickly as possible because that gives them a good experience and makes them feel like I'm not ignoring them and they're uh, they're getting like I'm jumping straight onto it and that's kind of a burden that I've made for myself and so what would happen is that when orders come in late on, on a Friday or on a Saturday morning when Saturday morning came I would pack those orders take them to the post office and mark them as shipped a notification email goes to my customer and they would uh, they would know that I've actually done it. The reality is that shipping it on a Saturday morning versus shipping it on the Monday morning makes zero difference in terms of when they receive it. The only difference is that they get the shipping notification two days sooner. So when my post office was no longer open on Saturdays, um, I I was forced to stop shipping on Saturday morning, and so I went from six day a week shipping to five day a week shipping and it felt like a burden had been lifted. It was like, oh, I can breathe because on Saturday mornings, I no longer have this fear, this thing in front of me where I have to get out, print the orders, get to the workbench, pack them. And I've got to get to the post office before it closes to get the orders all out. And so Saturday mornings now are a totally different experience to what they were um, before when I was doing shipping on Saturdays. And I can get a whole lot more done. <laughs> it's It just makes such a change. And what this really illustrated to me is how much that burden is impacting the other five days of the week for me. And I think I must just be burning so much, not just time, but motivation and opportunity because I'm spending five days a week being my own fulfillment company. And that is something that I really want to, um, uh, yeah, I really want to fix. I don't want to be doing that anymore. So that is part of it. Now, this is, this is kind of a detour from answering Aaron's original question. And Aaron's, the answer to Aaron's question is way more complicated than this. It's not just about a question of whether I am, um, <clears throat> whether I'm packing orders or not. It is also a matter of the work required to go from a board that I can show you here on a live stream. Okay, so imagine this little USB hub was a project that I wanted to put into production. I do the design work, do the prototyping, do the testing. I can get it 100% working. All right, a, a better example. <clears throat> the Because <laughs> this is one that Aaron cares about. The ESP Flasher project. I have gone through multiple iterations of that and design, I've gone through multiple circuit board designs. I've made prototypes. I've had a couple of problems, I've fixed them. I've got to the point now where I am as satisfied as I'm ever going to be with the design of that product. It's a circuit board that I've now had fabricated. I actually have a stack of them populated. Like I've got, um, I'm getting the, those ones done in mini panels and I've got populated ones sitting over there. Now, that, it seems like a very small step now to start selling them it's not going from i have going from having populated boards in your hand to being able to ship them out like accepting orders online and shipping them to customers 
is a huge amount of work and it's way more than most people realize. It's not fun work either and it's largely unseen. You, you have to do it but nobody even knows that you've done it and it's people like Sion and Brian Locke and others that have um, that have taken something that they have done as a semi-hobby project and turned it into something that can be sold who really appreciate all of that um, all of that work and um, so this is something that um, I I think it would actually be really useful to um, to have a discussion around this and I can I can just mention a couple of points here that as highlights like just touching on some things that are semi obvious to me but each one of these is a whole can of worms so the first uh, one thing is testing okay I can build a bunch of boards but I can't then just shove them into bags and post them out to customers they have to be tested even simple boards have to be tested at the very least you need optical inspection so you've got to visually check the board you need to make sure that there are no parts missing from it there are no solder bridges there are all of those sorts of obvious things that you can typically pick up in a manual um, visual inspection just make sure the boards are clean all of that sort of thing but then beyond that there is automated testing and designing automated testing can take longer than designing the device itself you have to think about all of the different ways the design could go wrong or manufacturing could go wrong what happens if this part was missing what happens if the there was a short across these two pins on this header um, what if the firmware hadn't loaded properly what if the um, the settings hadn't been updated in the USB to serial chip so the TX and RX LEDs aren't working how are you going to detect that you have to think about every single way this can go wrong and then how your tests can catch it so I mean that that last one I just mentioned a scenario using something like the CP2102 and USB to serial chip from the factory it doesn't have the TX and RX LEDs enabled those are general purpose IO pins on the chip and what you have to do is connect to the, um, the management software that Scilabs provide and change the settings in the chip. Now the chip will work perfectly fine as a USB to serial converter without those settings changed but the TX and RX LEDs won't work. Now this is a particularly relevant point for something like the ESP flasher because if your tests are based on I've got the ESP flasher and then I want to plug in USB from one side and plug something into the other side. Okay so think about that for a moment. You want to test a USB to serial converter how do you do it? What you need is another USB device on the other side, like another USB to serial converter. And then you have your device under test, which is like the missing link in a chain. You have a USB connection coming from your computer into your device under test. Then you've got the header on the other side, which is the serial interface. That needs to be plugged into another USB to serial converter, which then has USB going back to your computer. So what you then do is have software on your computer that has to send a message like a serial connection through your device under test and receive it back on the other device so you can prove there is a complete unbroken chain. So you have to set up the mechanicals of that to actually do your testing and then you have to write the software that is going to test that connection um, through the two USB ports. Then if you have forgotten to update the settings on the USB to serial adapter, the TX and RX pin LEDs won't illuminate. If your test is just plugging it in, pressing the button, the software successfully passes through, that will work. But your TX and RX LEDs won't work and maybe you didn't notice that. Maybe you just weren't paying attention that day and now you're shipping devices where the TX and RX LEDs don't work. So you have to think about, in my automated tests, how is it going to detect with whether the LEDs are working? So then you can put on um, something like TEMT6000 light sensors on your test jig to detect whether the LEDs are actually turning on and off. So your test rig now has to have an interface to those light sensors to detect the LEDs turning on and off. 
um, and you can also do it with like pogo pins if you have test points if you design test points onto your device what you can do is have a test um, bed with pogo pins so your test rig can measure the voltage that's being applied to the LED but that doesn't determine whether the LED is illuminating it only determines whether you're applying the correct voltage to it maybe your LEDs are installed backwards because your pick and place machine wasn't set up properly so you have to catch that so and this is just so far I'm just talking about testing um, testing itself is a huge bag of worms and then assuming you've got a comprehensive test system um, which is a daunting challenge to build and you have fully tested devices you now need to ship them out so you need an online tutorial like you need a connection guide which shows the pinout you need a tutorial um, you as soon as you start shipping them out you start getting tech support questions and I've got to admit that I am really really bad at responding to tech support questions because it is overwhelming I get um, I'm not even going to go into numbers but the number of queries that I get every day is crazy and once you have a product that is out in the marketplace years and years from now people will be contacting you saying um, I have this product that you made like seven years ago and I can't figure out um, which way around these pins go can you help me and then you look it up and you send a response and explain how it works and now you've just lost 20 minutes responding to that tech support request and that happens many many times a day so it's one of those things where as you end up with more and more um, products that are actually out in the market the burden of supporting them becomes bigger and bigger uh, then uh, I could go on and on about this <laughs> um, yeah so uh, yeah and um, as Aaron just said designing R&D testing production flow all comes with huge costs both money and time that people simply don't see or consider the subject deserves more time and streams in my opinion yeah I, I think it would be really cool to um, to have more discussion around this it's about the hidden parts of bringing a product to market and there are people like I've already mentioned um, Sion and Brian who have gone through this pain I've gone through this pain there are many other people in the chat right now who have gone through this pain and to some extent there is duplication of effort because there is not enough visibility of this part of the project of this part of the process and so there's a whole lot of reinventing the wheel things like people reinventing test jigs and reinventing the software frameworks that are used for testing uh, like I know for example that all of the test jigs that I've built have been using software that I have written 100% myself I haven't gone out and found some test like a, a generic test fixture with a generic test framework uh, that I could then adapt to myself so I've got to sit down from scratch and write the code that goes through and tests every IO pin tests whether there are bridges between them um, and I think it would be quite interesting to have a look at how other people do that because I could learn a lot I haven't seen much online other people talking about how they solve these problems and I would love to know how people do it because they probably do it in a better way than I do but just as an example of that all right so there is a um, just wondering if I can find I don't think I've got a great example of a test jig well I've got many test jigs here but all right <clears throat> here's the classic one uh, cross shorts on header pins the um, the test jig that we use for the Arduino Mega Where's a mega? Okay, so here's an Arduino, oh sorry, the Ether Mega. Arduino compatible board with a bunch of IO pins. I think it's 54 digital IO pins. I can't quite remember. Anyway, we have a test jig for this at the factory where they do the assembly. And the test jig has connections to every single pin on the header. And it has a bridge between every pair of pins. And <clears throat> What happens is 
we put in the um, the test code that we run on every single ether mega so as part of the production process it has the bootloader flashed onto it and then it has a multi-stage test process where it loads a test sketch onto it the test sketch then reports back over USB the results of its testing um, which can be logged in the factory and what it does is put every single pin into input mode and then it drives it turns one pin into output mode I mean, it's years since I've looked at this so um, <laughs> I may be telling you the wrong thing here but say it puts one pin into output mode and then it drives that pin high which way around is it? No, I think it drives it low. Yeah, it puts all pins into input mode with input pull-ups turned on. Then it drives one pin low and it reads every single other I.O. pin. And if any of them have gone low, it knows that there is a short circuit between those particular pins. <clears throat> and that short circuit could be a solder bridge at the processor, or it could be a solder bridge on the header, could be a fault on the PCB or whatever. Uh, the only pin that should go low is the one that is jumpered to it, so it's pair. So what it does is that that proves that, what that is proving is that there is no short to any other pin, and it is also proving that there is no break in the signal because it's driving the pin all the way to the end and then receiving that change back on its adjacent pin. And then it moves on to the next pair of pins and it does the same thing. So in the test code, it goes through and tests every single pin individually to make sure that both it is not shorted to a pin beside it and that it is actually actively driving the pin and that you can see a change when you drive it. So, um, I mean, that only takes a fraction of a second, but the code has to be written. So there's, there's this test code and it also does things like exercise the SD card and it exercises the Ethernet interface, so it actually checks whether um, a web page can be loaded and whether it can load content off the SD card. All of that is part of the test process. And defining and designing and then implementing that test process and writing the instructions for how to execute the tests, that is so much work. So at that point, <laughs> You have a product that can be packaged and sold and that's when the tech support uh, burden comes in. All right. Um, hmm. So. Uh, all right. I think that would be a, a cool in-depth conversation. So it, it kind of relates to that conversation that I flagged in the past that I'd like to have with Sion and other people where we talk about the we talk about costing a product. And when you're costing something, like if you figure out I've designed this and my bill of materials is X dollars, how much can I sell it for? That is a very big question with um, with a lot of complications to it. And it kind of relates to some of the things that I've just been talking about. So there are the barriers, those barriers between having a fully working prototype and being able to, like going to production and selling it, those are some of the costs that you have to factor into when you are um, working at your retail price. And um, it is possible to take shortcuts. Um, <laughs> Oh, that's a really nice point. Um, Sion just said, it's not bill of materials anymore. I've changed it. It's now bill of manufacturing. <laughs> yeah, that's a subtle change, but I think that summarizes it very well. Uh, yeah. It's not something to get into right now, but it, it is definitely a subject that is worth talking about in the future. Now, it's already well past my uh, two-hour time. <clears throat> And I didn't really answer Aaron's question. It's a really important question. It's a very interesting one. And I think what we need to do is talk about different aspects of that in the future and uh, get some other perspectives on it as well. Because the reason that I have so many projects in Eagle 
And beyond that, I have so many projects that are physical things that work and that I can use, but I haven't yet added it to the online store and said, okay, anyone can buy this. That is a real barrier that faces many people. All right. <clears throat> um, oh, yeah, so... Uh, Mako just said, Sion asked when to hold your small group conversation. I just realized I have totally, um, I had totally forgotten to check the back channel communications from Andy. <laughs> Luckily, Andy hasn't been taking time putting things in. I just looked right now. So I'm sorry, Andy. <laughs> I totally forgot about that. Um, all right. Uh, yeah. Oh, James just said I should direct Freetronic support to the forum or Discord. Yeah. Uh, that's one of the other complications is this relationship between Freetronics and Superhouse and me personally, because Freetronics and Superhouse are not the same thing. There are complications with that that I won't get into. They're, <clears throat> they're separate companies actually have different ownership structures and, um, that, has also been part of what for me has been a mental hurdle to get over, but I won't go into that right now. All right. <clears throat> yeah, oh, this is a good example. Andrew just said, so when we used to run a test on core memory, we needed to make sure the bits were not shorted to any of the other core driver lines. Core memory used both plus positive and negative voltages, test for all cross connections. Yeah. Um, yes. That's exactly it. <laughs> You've got to think about every single possible place that array could be um, shorted. And uh, I mean, I'm not an expert on core memory. I've just, I've seen actual physical core memory, <laughs> um, but I've never actually used it. So uh, yeah, I think core memory, the way it works is kind of similar to that whole matrix arrangement where you have means locking matrix. And then I think there's like an extra dimension to it. Anyway, that's off the topic. So I'm going to wrap it up for today. Um, considering that I started today with no idea what I was going to talk about, once again, I've managed to talk for two hours. I don't know how. But thank you all very much for uh, for coming along. Um, yeah, ah, oh, and Andy just pointed out it's a good idea, but still need to deal with support issues such as warranty or packages fail to arrive, which the community can't answer. Yeah. <clears throat> And I've got to say that in the age of COVID, that in itself is a real burden because postal services are just in chaos at the moment. And early on, there was some understanding of that. Like when, when things went crazy with the first COVID isolation here in Australia, there were huge delays. Many packages just disappeared. Thing Packages would sit for weeks or months in the distribution center and just never be delivered. And my customers were really understanding of that. And that understanding has now gone. So any of the goodwill that was around it seems to be over. Um, I'm now, it's now back to the point where People are uh, emailing me saying, why the hell hasn't my package arrived? It's been four weeks since I ordered it. And um, <laughs> the, the postal services aren't really in any better shape than they were three or four months ago. They're, they're just as congested and confused and warehouses full of unsorted packages. Um, but a lot of, a lot of people um, have got beyond that point now and they're thinking, oh, everything should be back to normal. Postal services should have caught up. It should all be fine. But it is not fine. Uh, international shipping is still a total random crazy potluck situation. Uh, I've had packages that I've shipped recently that have traveled from Australia to Europe or the US in a, in the space of only like three weeks and there are others that were shipped three months ago and they still haven't arrived. So who knows? Um, but yeah, dealing with with those sorts of things, yeah, that's not fun. Um, and even when a customer is being really good-natured about it, uh, 
before all of this happened, it was normal for packages from um, Australia to the US to take four to six weeks to arrive. And um, I would get people all the time email me saying, it's been a month since I sent my package. What has happened? Why haven't I got it? Did you even ship it? You know, those sorts of things. And I would send back a, like I'd look it up and I'd see, oh yeah, it was shipped four weeks ago. Seems to be always around the four week mark that these questions come up. And I would send back a reply saying, you know, it was shipped on this date. It's normal for it to take about four weeks from Australia to the USA. Uh, maybe wait a few more days and we'll see if it arrives. And then about two days later, I get an email back saying, oh, my package just arrived. Thank you. But then I've just spent 15 minutes, you know, dealing with answering the original inquiry. And um, so, and when that happens many, many times a week, uh, that sort of time adds up as well. But now, now that we really can't put any faith in our postal service at all because it's so random, those inquiries are, um, yeah, that the people wanting to know about packages, that's just an everyday thing and I can't answer the questions. That's what makes it really hard is that there, I can have shipped a package and also I take a photo of every single package I ever send and um, I send an email to the customer with a photo of their package saying, this is it, it was shipped. And I don't actually take the photo until I'm standing in the post office. So in the post office, the postage sticker goes on it with the package ID and everything else. I take a photo. The photo is then synced to Dropbox and I have a script that processes it and it looks up the barcode in the photo. It finds the original customer and it automatically sends them an email with it, with an attached photo of their package saying, your package has just been shipped, this is a photo of the package. And so I've got, I've got photographic proof that I've posted it, and uh, that gets sent to every single customer. So even with that level of customer service, um, yeah, I get people all the time contacting me saying, What's going on? Why haven't you shipped my package? Anyway, um, I <laughs> I could keep talking now, but I've got to stop. I'm going to go and get some lunch, and um, I hope you have found this interesting. Anyway, I think there have been some interesting topics that have come up. Uh, if anybody wants me to chase the, um, the Hacker Hub, USB-C hub with power monitoring and control, squirrel it's a pretty major squirrel and it's a pretty quick one so i might have to run fast to catch it but maybe we can talk about that in discord it's one of those things that's been like a low level personal project for a while i just haven't got around to pursuing it but first i need to ship the esp flasher what i should do is make <laughs> make a rule or a um all right a pledge an undertaking I'm not going to start a new project until the ESP flasher is available on the online store and I can ship it. All right, I've said it. <laughs> I'm gonna, I've got to do it. <laughs> so I hope you all have a fantastic weekend, whatever is left of it for you. And uh, I will talk to you all really soon, either next Sunday or in Discord, or hopefully I will get an actual video out. Still trying to work on this video for, um, for data logging. All right, the only way this is going to end is if I stop talking and click the end screen. Otherwise, I'll be here all afternoon. So thanks, everybody. Um, have a great weekend, and I'll talk to you later. Bye.